So before we continue with your uh, presentations for today, we'll have a short revision about what we discussed last meeting. So if you remember, we talked about Arjun Apadurai's disjuncture and difference in the global cultural economy. Uh, so today we'll discuss um, three key questions. The first is, what for Apadurai is strikingly new about the modern world? The second question we'll talk about in revising the last lecture is, what does it mean to say that there is a disjunction in the global cultural economy? And the third one is, what are the building blocks of today's imagined worlds and how are they distinct from and related to one another? So since we're just revising, I'll give you some time to think about these questions and then um, we'll discuss them. Okay, so for the first question, uh, what for Apadurai is strikingly new about the modern world? Uh, so if you remember, he said that the modern world today is highly interactive in a way that's different from um, previous periods. So, um, for example, the speed of communication today is much uh, faster than it used to be. Um, before, if you wanted to send a letter or if you wanted to communicate with somebody from another country, you had to send them a letter or you had to you know, travel overseas to actually get to talk to them or, or even um, use the phone. Uh, but now, the speed with which we can communicate with somebody, even from a different place, is um, instantaneous. Like you have Instagram, you have Facebook, you have all of these um, communicative technologies that allows you to interact with other people from, from other places in the world. The second feature for um, the, the modern world is that it is deterritorialized, meaning that the elements that make up our world, elements like people, elements like commodities, um, money, technologies, they're not confined to a geographical space anymore. So the, the second feature of deep territorialization is also related to the notion of interactivity. Um, elements today are have uh, more leeway or more space to interact with one another because they are not bounded by physical territories. So the third feature for Apadurai um, is fractality or, or the modern world for Apadurai is fractal. If you look up the meaning of fractal, it means uh, without boundaries, structures, or regularities. These are cultural objects that overlap with and resemble one another. So before we discussed Apadurai, if you remember, we talked about um, Akbar Abbas, and he talked about Hong Kong and its other histories. He also used the word fractal, but um, Apadurai uses the word fractal in a slightly different way. So if you remember, when Abbas talked about uh, the word fractal, he meant that um, a fractal is something that is constantly replicating uh, itself. So it's like um, constantly replicating, meaning duplicating itself. Uh, he talked about how Hong Kong cities are fractals of one another. Like, uh, the, if you go to Sham Shui Po, for instance, the structures that you find in Sham Shui Po might be very similar to other cities in Hong Kong. Or if you look at Tun Mun and you go to Tai Po, maybe, the, the features that you see in Tun Mun, the kinds of architecture, architecture or um, layouts, layouts that you see in Tun Mun could also be seen in a place like Tai Po. So for Abbas, that is what fractal means. But Apadurai, as I said, uses the word fractal in a slightly different way. This is a picture of a fractal. So this is an example of a fractal. Uh, objects overlap with one another. Objects replicate one another. There is no regularity of structure in the fractal. So if you think about the meaning of fractal again, a fractal is a pattern that replicates itself um, constantly. Uh, so if you look at the, like this, the, these small fractals are, are miniature models of the bigger fractal. So there is a sense of uh, replication and also there is a sense of spreading. So the fractal spreads, the fractal replicates and it spreads. So for Apadurai, um, cultural objects in today's modern world are like fractals. They replicate and they spread. Uh, so, given these uh, characteristics of the modern world, uh, for Apadurai, analysis that depends on boundaries 
is flawed and unable to grasp the complexity of cultural phenomena. Because if you just think that a cultural object is confined to a single territory, that it has a pure form, that it does not interact with other cultural objects, then an analysis like that would be flawed. So for instance, um, one example that we can think about in relation to this is the notion of food. Can you say that there is a Cantonese food? Can you say that there is Indian food, that there is Filipino food? If you consider that food travels along with people, and every time you go to a different territory, the ingredients that go into food also change because of the different ingredients or materials that are available in the new territory or the new tastes that are in that territory. So if you consider all of these things, um, it's difficult to say that there is a pure Cantonese food. If you go to, if you go to, for example, India and eat Cantonese Cantonese food, um, can you still say that that is Cantonese food, even if it's using slightly different materials or ingredients, even if it's um, slightly sweeter maybe or saltier than how Cantonese food is in Hong Kong? So there is no sense of a pure form for, for cultural objects, given these characteristics of the modern world. Okay, so the second question, what does it mean to say that there is a disjuncture in the global cultural economy? Um, disjuncture means separation or disconnection. And um, so if there is separation or disconnection, what is separated, what is disconnected? For a Padurai, in today's modern world, there are separations or disconnections between economy, culture, and politics, which heighten the complexities of today's global cultural economy. So for example, before, with, um, with maybe at the beginning period of modern nation states, one could still assume that um, the sphere of economics, culture, and politics are united, uh, meaning that the culture or, or the political cultures of a place is defined by the kinds of people that also inhabit that place. Uh, let me give a think of an example. So for example, in, in Saudi Arabia, where you have a, a political form of government that is also based on the cultural, um, the cultural form of religion. So for example, in Saudi Arabia, you, they use Sharia law because it's a primarily Muslim country they are able to use Muslim laws in order to govern society, right? So it's an example of a, a society where you have culture and politics as a kind of aligned. But in today's modern world, um, many societies are plural, meaning that most societies are made up of different races, the different ethnicities, different languages, and all of these factors mean that it's more difficult to um, ensure that your political systems are aligned or integrated or corresponding to uh, economic or cultural systems. So for instance, if you have a country where you have some Christians, some Muslims, some Buddhists, and some, what else, Hindus maybe, like how do you decide what laws that everyone can adopt, given that there are also um, cultural variations that may uh, that may influence the way laws are are conducted. So, for example, in the Philippines, which is a, which is a good example of a plural society, you have um, a majority Christian population, but you also have a very significant Muslim population. So, if in the Muslim population they allow, for instance, um, having several wives, up to four wives, under Muslim law. Um, but legally, you can only marry one wife because of the majority uh, Christian society. Uh, so which law or which regulation do you follow? Uh, will the law allow um, marrying four wives for everyone to account for the Muslim population as well? Or uh, do we stick to what the majority population wants? So that's one example of when a disconnection between the sphere of culture and the sphere of politics can lead to complexities in negotiating um, social norms or cultural objects. Okay.
the third question. Uh, what are the building blocks of today's imagined worlds and how are they distinct from and related to one another? So Apadurai extends the ideas of Benedict Anderson in imagined communities. So if you remember, uh, according to Benedict Anderson, we imagine the communities that we belong in. Um, the idea of nation arises out of our imagination of the people that we belong to. Uh, a people with a common destiny, a people with a common heritage. So we imagine that we belong to this, this kind of community. Um, and that imagination is mediated by the print form or by cultural objects. So for Benedict Anderson, the, what mediates or what allows the development of this imagination is the print form. Uh, meaning um, printed newspapers or periodicals, books, novels, etc. So the circulation of these cultural objects written in the same language dealing with similar issues or themes leads to an imaginary, uh, an imagination of a, uh, of a shared community, a shared heritage. But for Apadurai, um, given that in today's world, cultural objects have become highly interactive, deterritorialized, and fractal, uh, we need to extend Benedict Anderson's theorization of how an, a community or an imagined community comes about. So for Apadurai, these are the elements that make up uh, the way we imagine communities today. So the first one are ethnoscapes, which refer to the movement of people. The second one are technoscapes, which refers to the movement of technologies. The third one, financecapes, refers to the movement of capital. Uh, mediascapes refers to the movement of technologically mediated information, especially in the form of images and narratives. So it's not just information per se, but technologically mediated information. So it matters um, how this information is transmitted. Because uh, if you transmit information through a photograph, uh, the transmission of that information differs from information that you transmit via words. So for instance, a, a photograph that depicts something can cross certain cultural boundaries because an image can be interpreted um, openly in various ways. But if I write something in Korean and somebody tries to read it, if that person does not know Korean, then that message, that narrative, will not be transmitted. So, mediascapes refers to how narratives and images are also mediated through different kinds of forms and technologies. And the last one is the ideoscape, uh, which refers to the movement of ideologies, including ideas, terms, and images. So, when we talk about ideologies, if you follow the Gramscian um, notion of ideology, it refers to how a group is able to dominate another group in society by normalizing certain narratives. But if we take um, the meaning of ideology in the broadest sense, it is simply a systematic or coherent system of ideas. So um, the use of scapes is interesting because it comes from the word landscape. It is a field of movement, it is a field of distribution, it is a kind of geography. But uh, going back to the notion of deterritorialization, today the movement of these elements are no longer bounded by physical territories. So a technoscape, for example, is often not physical. It can be physical because you need to transport um, machinery, you need to transport um, engines, you need to transport technological objects. But also, if you think of the digital sphere, which is also a technoscape, um, although it uses physical components, the virtual sphere is also immaterial to a large extent. So that allows for greater movement of things. So um, for Apadurai, these spheres are related to one another because they make up our society. However, they are often governed by different logics or different rules. So for instance, ethnoscapes, um, movement of people, uh, financecapes, movement of capital. Often, the movement of capital is much freer than the movement of people, or the movement of objects, or the movement of commodities. 
If I want to buy something from Guangzhou or Shenzhen, I can order it online and it will arrive uh, to me in, in a week or maybe two weeks. But if I want to go to Guangzhou or to Shenzhen, I will still have to apply for a Chinese visa. I will have to wait one to two weeks. I will then arrange for my transportation and so on. So there are limits to the movement of people, the ethnoscape, uh, that are not present in the movement of, for example, capital. So although they are related to one another, they also govern according to different, or they also are governed by different logics. So in order to understand a cultural phenomena, we need to understand the logics that govern particular scapes. So for example, this is an example of a phenomenon where you have uh, the interaction of idealscapes, financecapes, ethnoscapes, mediascapes, and so on. This is uh, Mary Jasmine Reyes. Uh, what's her name? Oh, she's Mary... Mary, yeah. She's, a, she's an Australian actress, model, TV host, TV personality, Instagram influencer, and so on. I follow her, I follow her in, on Instagram. So this is, this is one of her Instagram posts. Uh, and if you notice, um, so first you have the movement of people. She's Australian, but right now she is in Bohol. That's in an island in the Philippines. Um, so here you have a, an example of an ethnoscape, the movement of, of a person. And of course, some people are more mobile than other people. Uh, so if, if uh, uh, that has to do with racial categories, visa things, and, and so on, but we'll, we won't go into that too much right now. So here is an example of an ethnoscape. This is also an example of a technoscape as well as a mediascape and an ideoscape. So for, uh, if you look at the image, she is using a technology like a phone to transmit not only an image of herself, but an image of what she represents. Mobility, um, privilege, uh, attractiveness, uh, what else does she um, transmit? Uh, the ideal of a certain lifestyle. So it's not just her. No, it's not just a woman, the image of a woman that is transmitted, but it's also what she represents. And if you also look at, for example, the history of, of female objectification, if you want to read into that, we can also look at how often the idea of the Instagram influencer rests on the, commodity, on the long history of the commodification of the female body, for instance. So there are many ways to read this image. So I'm just pointing out some of the elements that are present in this image um, okay so if you look at the content of her message she is um, presumably sponsored by this resort or this hotel in Bohol so she says ready for you Bohol so far so good even if I sat on a wasp this morning staying at the beautiful Donatella Hotel via Weddings Hitchbird so Donatella Hotel is the name of the place where she's staying at Weddings Hitchbird is um, it's a company that is an events organizer, so it arranges wedding plans and so on. So in this um, image, it's not only transmitting an idea, but it's also literally selling something. It's selling you the place, or it's marketing the place to you. It is marketing a business to you. And it seems to be highly effective because after she posted that, one commenter here said, I just booked the place. Hope I'll get a welcome champagne too. So here you see how the movement of people um, bringing with them certain ideas, transmitting images of themselves is also central to the movement of capital in today's world and also the movement of other people. So this image or, or if you look at the, at the idea of the Instagram influencer, a lot of elements come into play. Ethnoscapes, technoscapes, mediascapes, ideoscapes. And in order to understand that phenomenon, we have to consider these different scapes and how they interact with one another. So if you have further questions, um, I'll, I'll be glad to, to take them. If not, then we will move on to your presentations. Thank you.